Back to some boring subjects. I understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. This is a special in the, uh, this is a special series called The Path to Libertarianism. I'm going to talk to my good friend Brian Nichols about his path to liberty. So stay tuned right after this. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Welcome to the program. My name is Chris Fang. I'm still getting my bearings. This is the earliest I have ever recorded a podcast, I swear. <laughs> 8, 8.30. And so I'm barely awake. The caffeine has not yet kicked in. But somewhere, somewhere about halfway through this uh, uh, podcast, I'm going to be bonkers because uh, that early morning caffeine kicks in and I just go nuts. And uh, I wouldn't podcast this early for anyone, but I do uh, for my good friend, Brian Nichols, who uh, I love and respect so much, who has a show in the network called The Brian Nichols Show, which you all should be downloading and listening to every single week. Brian, thanks for joining me. Absolutely, Chris. And thanks for accommodating your, uh, your sleep schedule to an early, uh, an early show with me. That's okay. I don't want to get you in trouble with your wife. <laughs> Much appreciated. House hunting day will do that. So uh, priorities, man, priorities. Yeah. So congratulations on being able to afford a house. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not so much being able, but needing to have a house instead of a uh, renting. So it's just one of those things, you know, a nice little stepping stone. Yeah, well, you know, there's not a ton of money in the podcasting game, but uh, <laughs> it, when you can afford a house, listen, that's, it's, a, it's impressive. Uh, Brian, you've hosted a show on the network for how long now? Uh, just over two years now. So 20, uh, 2020 marked my, my two years here at uh, We Are Libertarians on the network. And actually, this past week was episode 100 um, wow. for the Brian Nichols show. So yeah, it was a pretty cool, a pretty cool milestone to hit. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one to get to. Most people, literally most people never get past 10. Yeah. So because I think, and you've started a podcast now. Most people say, I'm going to start a podcast within several days of starting this podcast, I'm going to have advertisers throwing <laughs> money at me. I'm going to have thousands of listeners. Uh, it's, I'm going to be able to hire people within six months. And that's not how, how it works at all. It's a lot of work. It's a part-time job usually. Uh, so to get to 100 is a huge accomplishment and your ratings are through the roof. They're huge. If huge ratings, Brian. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, we'll we'll just take Donald Trumpisms and and throw it onto the uh, the, the podcast descriptors. Huge, yeah. grand, wonderful. No podcast like it out there. Yeah, you and Boss Hog, uh, kind of, they're about forty episodes ahead of you. But you both, in the last six months, your numbers have just absolutely gone crazy. So you're kind of in a magic time where you're about to start really growing. So it's that's that's great news. Um, but. The goal of the this series, The Path to Libertarianism, is to really help newbies, people who may not know a lot about libertarianism. Uh, on Tuesday, we're going to do an episode where we're going to have someone who's fairly new to the ideology come on and ask questions and, and talk about some of that stuff. Uh, this, like is, that. this is a pre-recorded episode for if I get sick or if, you know, so this may air long in the future, Brian, just to let you know. But That's fine. Um, one of the one of the things we like to do in this series is talk to people who are further down uh, further down the train as Mary Ruart once told me uh, and, and talk about their path to libertarianism and, and kind of talk about their journey so the listener you dear listener can maybe hear points of uh, agreement and um, find yourself in the stories of people who are a little further down the path and Brian so let's just start with uh, the day of your birth what what sort of <laughs> What sort of political family were you born into? Like, what, were, what was the ideology and, and where did you fall, you know, as you kind of developed into an adult? Yeah, and, it, you know, it really was at the time that pretty much, you know, I, I learned what was going on in the world. I was really immersed in politics. I mean, my, my family, very political household. I grew up, my dad was a, a county legislator for my home district. 
So for, I mean, for 15 years, really, that, that was, you know, our life was always, you know, involved in some, you know, form of politics in, in whether it's local elections or, you know, looking at anything from a national um, or state level, you know, we would get involved for, you know, let's see, <laughs> we did county clerk elections, um, you know, we helped with state, state uh, Senate elections, assembly elections, um, U.S. Congress. So like my family's always involved with the people in these political parties. Um, and namely, you know, being in the GOP, my dad had to you know, work more with them, but he would do a lot of bipartisan stuff. So I got to meet Hillary Clinton, Chuck Schumer. Um, I helped, uh, or I say I helped. I, I was able to, to volunteer as like a, a kid of a you know, political uh, candidate, um, which is nice to be able to meet a lot of these cool people. Um, you know, in my life, I looked up to as, as role models. Um, so, so, so New York Democrat. <laughs> so, so no, believe it or not. Um, up in New York is very different politically where you go from the, the, the urban more like, you know, New York city or just a greater New York city area up to like truly upstate New York. And it's almost like two different States. Um, upstate New York is much more like, imagine like redneck South, but right. redneck North. Um, I mean, for whatever reason, people fly Confederate flags up there. And I'm like, you do realize that like nobody <laughs> here fought in the Confederacy. Right? Indiana, is very, <laughs> Indiana is very much the same. And, and, and ironically, actually you're from the same area as the host of the boss hog of Liberty, mm -hmm. Jeremiah Morrill. You guys are distant cousins. Are you not? I mean, we're, we're just going to say at least we, we, we think we are. He's got a nickel somewhere down, <laughs> down like multiple generations back that he had, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. Here in Indiana, I mean, there's Confederate flags everywhere. And we were a northern state and <laughs> fought for the Union and only Bogstown seceded to the, to the uh, Confederacy, which yeah. this tiny little town in Indiana uh, seceded. But um, yeah, so it's a weird phenomenon because people think, oh, if you're in the North, you're Yankees. But there are a lot of people who are just kind of like uh, rednecks is a good way to put it, I guess. Yeah. And like, I think a lot of it too is just they're, they're very, you know, almost like they're apathetic to everything that's happening around because when they, they're, they're promoted, you know, by like when Hillary, right, when she did the whole basket of deplorables and like you, you characterize this, this entire group of people in that kind of mindset, it really is like, you know, us against the rest of the world. I mean, there's been multiple uh, promotions to, to break New York State in half and you'd have like the New York State uh, be the New York City versus upstate New York region. And like that's been promoted pretty much as long as I can remember just because people felt so really unrepresented from New York City. But at the end of the day, New York City pretty much is, is the main, you know, not only voting block for the entire state, but really all the decisions that are made in the statewide level are pretty much come down to New York City. And that, you know, just being from a state like that, and this is a complete, you know, side subject, but it also kind of speaks to me the value of what we have in electoral college because, you know, I grew up in a state where, you know, being in the middle of literally nowhere, northern New York, my entire, you know, way of life was impacted by people who lived hundreds of miles away from me that, they had no, recoll no, no recollection, no understanding of the way we live up in Northern New York. I mean, for us, we're literally in the middle of the woods. You need a gun to, to defend yourself, whether it's against you know, someone else, a wild animal, whatever it may be. But you know, the police response time isn't instantaneous like it is in New York. So you don't pick up the phone, you have a police car there in you know, a couple of minutes. You, you'd be lucky if you have somebody there in a couple, you know, couple maybe an hour if you're lucky, just because right. you are so far in the middle of nowhere. So I mean, that was one thing that kind of helped shape my, my views as I've grown up as well, is just kind of seeing that, that dichotomy that I had to you know, really grapple with and saying, I didn't feel represented. And I, I see a lot of people in New York State who also feel that way, um, but I don't think it's unique to just New York. And obviously, you know, we, we, we see across the United States that that was true. I mean, Pennsylvania went for Trump, um, Michigan went for Trump. It's like these traditional blue, you know, blue collar and you know, blue dog Democrat states all of a sudden going for, for Trump. And I think it kind of goes back to that, you know, being characterized in, in that way, almost being like the, the redneck and that basketball deplorable. But like, there just seems to be like two different Americas right now. And it's not based on where we live, but based on our ideology. And it's, it's interesting to see that split because, you know, in, in the future, you know, let's say we ever were have a situation where somebody were to pull away again. I don't, I don't know how that would work nowadays because we're so, we're so diverse in our, our population across a large geographic area that like you'd have, you know, have to have people like almost migrate to get away from certain areas. Cause like upstate New York versus New York city, it's a completely different area versus you know, where you're from in Indiana or, you know, where think of anybody else who's been you know, in, our, in our network all across the United States, but we all have the same ideas, but we're not, we're not in the same geographic area. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been something I've been thinking about. It's, it's a weird thing to kind of go down that, that rabbit hole. 
we have that here in Indiana. You know, where the Boss Hog guys are, they uh, they just had Tom Saunders, a state rep, on, and Saunders is legendary in the state house for being the the rural representative who rails against Indianapolis. You know, Indianapolis is a quarter of the state's population, its revenue. I mean, it's it's the engine that drives the rest of the state. And no offense to, to our people in Henry County or White County or Clinton County, but you know, it's not Marion County. It's, it's the it, center township is a completely different animal than Newcastle, Indiana. Right. And there's a tremendous, and even when I was executive director of the state libertarian party, you know, it was the, the rural Northern counties saying, you know, Spangle doesn't come up here enough. He spends too much time around the, the urban and suburban Indianapolis counties. You know, and I know from our neighbors next door, Illinois is vastly, it's, it's enormous. Mm-hmm. But Chicago really rules the state, and that breeds a lot of resentment in places like Springfield or Normal or Bloomington, Illinois. Um, so I think that is going to be a really big tension point as we move to, towards a more urbanized society where people move into cities as they are away from rural areas. And there's that natural tension point within states that that really threatens the republic because, you know, if you're if you're in Center Township here in Indiana and you live in downtown Indianapolis, the 12th largest city, and you don't own a car because you can walk to the Whole Foods, and you, you your vote doesn't count, right? Like because you're in Indiana, when at least in terms of president, so, yep, um, that that that's why I think you see the the tension with the electoral college, but, um. So when did you start to really get into politics? Like, what's the first thing that kind of caught your eye? Like, I, for me, it was the Clinton impeachment. And I was like, I really think I like this politics stuff. <laughs> I, I mean, the Clinton impeachment was definitely one of the first, like, real big political events that I, I can really think back to. And, like, it piqued my interest. But I think I really didn't get super involved in in caring about the politics of everything until, like, 2000. That was really kind of my my jumping off point into getting more interested in, in caring about politics. And a lot of it came with not only the Bush election against Gore, but also, um, you know, with my dad being so involved in politics, we had uh, elected or rather uh, politicians who were running for office that would come through our area looking for votes. So I remember it was in 2000, Rick Lazio was running against Hillary Clinton and uh, Rick Lazio came to a local eatery that we were good friends with the owners of. And uh, you know, that for me, I, there's a, picture that was in the paper of me getting my uh, like a Rick Lazio sign signed and I was enamored I was like you know think I met the president of the United States um, <laughs> on, only to have him lose like it was like 75 to 25 percent in the, the general election against Hillary um, but that was probably the first like real big election where I was like okay I, I kind of I'm starting to see the, the difference in the the two parties I'm, I'm seeing that and I say you know it has me as a probably you know little elementary school kid but like seeing that there was something different in a Republican versus a Democrat um, but actually starting to become more politically aware it's not just you know you have the good guys and the bad guys it's like now they're it's much more complex there's layers to it um and then that kind of started off my big old rah-rah gop to 20 uh, 2004 and i was you know all for george bush again against john Kerry, and it was it was a, it was a whole you know progression of me going down this neoconservative rabbit hole um pretty much up through man probably my sophomore year of college i was it's probably sophomore junior year of college i was i mean college republican president so hey, I was too. always rah rah. Yeah, exactly. I, I was to see our president in 2004, and uh, that was the Bush election year. And mm-hmm. Mitch Daniels was running here, which stupid me went and helped Andy Horning, who I love. I have an Andy Horning poster on my wall here, uh, and and really was instrumental in me becoming a libertarian. But like I, you know, I, I should have chosen Mitch because all the CR chairs got really nice jobs in the administration, except for <laughs> me. Um, but. Yeah, I I, I, rem- I put on basically the the uh, uh, pro war rally in 2003, <laughs> uh, for for lack of a better word, as a support the truth rally downtown, and like I was just sold out on it too. I mean, it was I loved being CR chair, but there were there were already strains for me. I don't know what years you were chair, but like that was the immigration election, the gay marriage election, and they almost impeached me because I said I I agree with Bush's immigration plan. And I don't care about gay marriage. And the and the <laughs> membership was like, we got to get rid of this guy. He's not a real conservative. Uh, so, like, did you – when you were CR chair, did you have, like, little strains? I mean, what years? What were the issues that you were kind of talking about? Yeah, so I was, I was in college from 2010 to 2014. So my, my CR president years were, like, 2011 to 2012. And um, 
And really the main issues at the time were number one, um, it was a Tea Party revolution. So that was, you know, big, big push, fiscal conservatism, constitutionalism. It's kind of funny, like we, we see this, this ebb and flow of the GOP going back and forth and flirting with fiscal, like fiscal conservatism. And, and it, that was like, when I was like, yeah, I'm a Republican, like, you know, Thomas Massey, Rand Paul, Justin Amash, Mike Lee, like these are all the good guys. Right. And, and that's what the GOP was, was saying too. And now it was easy for me at that point to be, you know, the, the head of, of uh, the college Republicans because they were kind of echoing this uh, pseudo libertarian idea. I mean, the tea party was as close to the Republican party as being, you know, anything libertarian as I can really think of in recent years. Yeah. Um, I mean, Rand Paul is a cent. I mean, he, he's not obviously a true, like big L libertarian, but he's easily one of the most libertarian leaning senators we, we've probably ever had in American history. Um, yeah. I think the thing with Massey and Paul, I was thinking about this with Massey last night. He's, he was celebrating impeachment. It's like, what, what those guys do is they they go Republican on the things that don't really matter so they can yes. stand up on the principled things like, all right, I, I'm going to I'm going to send this tweet celebrating Trump not getting impeached because it doesn't really matter. But when it comes around to surveillance, then I then I'm going to be able to survive the base. Yeah. I mean, when when we had the whole debacle where we were almost going to war with Iran and there's the whole war, power, uh, war powers resolution that was taking place. I mean, Mike Lee and, and Rand Paul, who probably are two of the more you know staunch defenders of Trump during this entire impeachment process, were some of the loudest voices in the Senate to, to join with the Democrats saying, yeah, this needs to be curtailed some. We need to get some more info. And we shouldn't have it that the president can just sign, you know, uh, an executive order to go pretty much launch, you know, uh, an invasion into a country or, or strikes onto a country. Um, so you know, that's one thing too, I think a lot of libertarians have to, to remember. And I say this as someone who is coming from more of that establishment political like world that I lived in, is that the word pragmatic isn't a bad thing. It's just, a, it's a necessary evil. Like you have to realize that not everybody is at the level that we're at in terms right. of number, number one, how we look at politics, but also how we, we look at the issues and how we approach the issues. Most people want to see, they, they, look, they don't look at government like we do. We look at government as, you know, a, a, a device has been put in place to curtail freedoms. And usually it's people who've been put in place to do good things, but they end up with negative uh, unintended consequences as a result of these policies. Right. But the, the problem is that a lot of people, they look at government as the, per, the people who are going to fix things. Mm -hmm. And we have, instead of like calling them, you know, statists and, and telling them they're not really libertarians, which they're not. I mean, honestly, they're not libertarians and that's okay. But instead of telling them that we have to teach them instead of shunning them away and actually help guide them through the process. But that means we have to give a little bit too. That means that when we can get something accomplished in some way, shape or form, we should go for it. So like, you know, Thomas Massey, I'm all for him, you know, going a, 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 you know, party line with all the things that really don't matter because it doesn't matter. So if he can build that political clout within the GOP of going along with things that really, from a truly principled libertarian standpoint, don't really matter in, in the grand scheme of things, but then like, he can stand up and, you know, really, plant his flag on a libertarian issue and say, here's my principles. Here's why I'm voting no on this. It makes them sound much more reasonable. Right. Absolutely. Incredible. Uh, incredible. That's the main thing too. And I, I just actually talked about this last week with uh, Jacob Hornberger on my show is that like, you know, part of the thing with the libertarian party is we're at a point right now where we have to decide, are we going to have someone leading the party who's truly principal, but also credible candidate, or are we just going to have somebody who is going to you know try to out libertarian everybody else and not really be a good marketing but also you know asset to bring more people into the, the party than somebody who is a truly principled person who is trying to be more pragmatic and actually teach and reach out to people and hopefully change people's hearts and minds to get them to stick with us instead of you know three four million votes and then within the next two years half that if not more or just gone again so getting people to, to be interested in libertarianism but also to be libertarians for the long haul that's what i think we need to change our mindset a little bit but it comes with how we're going to approach actually interacting with people to get them to be libertarians in the first place yeah, so here's the funny thing about Jacob Hornberger. I believe it was against Harry Brown that Jacob Hornberger was the radical choice really? against, against Harry Brown, who was despised by a lot of radicals in the LP and is still to this day one of the greatest messengers the Libertarian Party has ever had. Um, you, you find a lot of people who go, I'm a Libertarian because of Harry Brown or I'm a Libertarian because of Gary Johnson. Uh, that, that position of LP candidate this is why it's incredibly important because the LP presidential candidate becomes the de facto leader of yep. libertarian thought. Um, I, I respect Jacob Hornberger a lot. I use his stuff. I re, I'm a subscriber to his journal. I, I, we, we rely on a lot of uh, what he's built over at FFF. 
mm-hmm. here at We Are Libertarians. But it's interesting to me that he has almost become the pragmatic choice for the presidential race and not the radical choice as he was. That's how far the Overton window where Vermin Supreme is yeah. the alleged – he's not the leader uh, in the race. Uh, but because of New Hampshire's insane way that they to- totaled their votes. But Hornberger to me um, – Here's the problem. You have Gary Johnson who gets 3%, and there was uh, in the 2000 race, I believe, a more pragmatic candidate for – it might have been Harry Brown himself. And then the base was like, no, this was a terrible candidate. He didn't represent Liberty well. We need a radical candidate. And so they put up Michael Badnarik in 2004, and he destroyed all that progress because he was completely inept at running a campaign, totally uninspiring. And a little bit weird. I'm not <laughs> saying that's Jacob Hornberger, but uh, Badnarik's Constitution class is an amazing class. Like, take Michael Badnarik, go look up on YouTube Michael Badnarik's Constitution class or read his book. But when the average voter went to look at the LP presidential candidate that year, they said, This is not a person who can organize a cabinet. Mm. This is not a person who can really be president. They're not prepared. And so that's sort of my fear with this, this cycle for the Libertarian Party is that they give back that ballot access that was won at 3% because they pick the most radical, we're only here to advertise the Libertarian message from a, an anarchist point of view, and it freaks the hell out. You know, your grandmother or my uncle or, you know, the, the coworker that asks that's mildly interested and possibly – voting for your candidate you give their website they come back the next day they go what the hell was that yep like you know that's why adam kokesh vermin supreme ben letter these people are not serious choices because somebody's gonna take that's that really was our criticism of gary johnson gary johnson when asked on the 60 minutes interview who he'd fill out his cabinet had no answer for it he was totally unprepared to be president of the United Mm -hmm. States. Bill Weld in that question had to bail him out and start giving some names of people that he might appoint. And so I I think the Libertarian Party really runs the risk of not being taken seriously again. Again, it's nothing against Hornberger. I would vote for him. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's the only (laughs) one in this field that I would vote for because, again, I respect him. I think he's – but this impulse of Gary Johnson sucked, we need something more pure – has backfired in multiple different, you know, cycles. And we just don't learn our lesson in the libertarian movement ever. It seems, <laughs> it seems to me. So, um, well, you know, one thing I, I was, I, I've been thinking about too, and I, I've articulated this in my show before and some other folks show um, is that I think we have to also change a little bit our perspective of how we're, we're looking at elections and such, instead of looking at as who's, who's the most libertarian versus who's going to be the most electable, is looking at really like who's the best salesperson, um, not versus who's the most like intelligent and in terms of like reading the dogma of libertarianism like verbatim. Like we have to get people who can actually go out and to the American public sell libertarianism, sh- sell the value of what we're bringing to the table. So, and I think that's what Ron Paul was good about. With yes, Ron Paul exactly. was very principled, but he was also good at selling you. You go listen to some of those 08 speeches. They're very hopeful. There's a lot of hope and not – there's a lot of change, but there's also a lot of hope, too. And that's my one criticism of Hornberger is sometimes he can be a little bit, I told you so. If only you listened to me 40 years ago, it's like, all right, well, what are you going to do now? Like, so mm-hmm. um, that, 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 that's exactly what you're saying. But Hornberger is a good salesman. I mean, he does make very good points, and I think that's where he can be. When people say he's the next Ron Paul, I don't go, oh, that's ridiculous. I say, yeah, I can see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the thing is, too, I mean, my, my day job, I'm the director of sales um, for a telecom company up here in the East Coast. And one of the things that my, my team, what I do is I, I teach about selling value, right? But the selling the value is the main point is to get somebody to pique their interest enough to say, yes, we'll sit down with you to learn more, right? And that's when you bring your engineer to the table. Now, the engineer in the libertarian world, that's going to be the people who can say, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and list you off you know, like every single Murray Rothbard book. And, you know, I can tell you the, the values of, you know, anarcho-capitalism, you know, to a T. But before we get there, we have to get people at least interested. The problem the libertarian party, I found, especially in the, you know, well, just my 
interactions with the party since really 2015 or so, but also just kind of looking back through history is that we seems that we've been more in the mindset of putting the engineer first and having the engineer be the person doing the cold calls. And it's like, you get somebody on the phone, they start regurgitating, you know, all the, the information that they have. It's great information, but the person that they're talking to isn't in a, a frame of mind yet to, to hear the information and absorb it. So right. I think as a party, we have to kind of do a, a, you know, take a step back and do a self-reflection and say, listen, it's not a matter of, you know, if you're a good libertarian or a bad libertarian, it's a matter of who's doing the, the best at their particular roles. And let's make sure people are, are focused. You know, I mean, really it's like a division of labor kind of thing. Who, who can we you know, direct to do certain things that are best for their skill set? I think the problem is a lot of libertarians who think they're really great salespeople, unfortunately, are not the, the salespeople. They're the engineers. And they need to, and it's not a matter of like saying, learn your role. But like, if you're more valuable in that position of being the teacher, being like, you know, the, the person who's going to help lead people through the progression of libertarian thought, then be that person. But don't, don't try to be something you're not. Try to try to really, you know, number one, find what your skill set is and become the master of that skill set. If you, I mean, if you're a really good, you know, salesperson, try and refine a message of, you know, selling libertarianism. Think of a, a thirty-second libertarian elevator pitch. You know, what would you say to somebody if they said, "Why should I vote libertarian in 2020?" And you have to be not only, you know, quick and to the point, but your 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 value proposition has to be convincing, and it has to be. It has to be unique enough, but also relatable enough to them, that, that voter, that they feel like, okay, this could be something for me. Can I learn some more information? When they say, can I learn more? Now you've already opened the door a little bit and you're slipping your foot in to actually bring them to the engineer and say, okay, here's the person who can give you all the information you want. Listen, you're in great hands now. Talk to them. Ask all the questions you want from them. I'm going to go you know, find some more people to be libertarians. And that's what we have to start doing, I think, as a party and just as a movement is get out of our, our comfort zones of what we think we're good at you really do some self-introspection and figure out what are we actually good at and then direct people to do those particular things again whether it's sales engineering leadership um i i hope that we can actually you know put some of our egos away as a party and as a, as a movement to actually do that because i think a lot of people just are like no nope, i can do it you know put the, the round hole through a square peg it's going to work great and it doesn't and and that's why we spin our wheels and we get one percent every election i think because we're not putting the right people in the right positions and honestly chris that's why i was such a big fan of todd Hagopian because when he was running for chair, he really had like his his bullet points of like what he had for a structure of professionalizing the party, uh, professionalizing the party, focusing on local elections, and getting up like a consistent branding and marketing across the board. And I mean, part of the problem I think what we've seen is that the Libertarian Party is a lot just herding cats. A lot of different narratives, a lot of different um, you know different value statements are being put out there. There's no one overarching like you know narrative that's being promoted by the LP, and just you know sales 101 you have to have whatever that narrative is across the board what's what's the one thing that your your company in, you know like just make it private sector related what's the one thing your company does the best why do your customers stick with you you know that's why customers you, you always, always have companies who reflect their customer retention rate you know if your customer retention rate you know 96 percent, that's awesome why do people stick with you though is it that you have a really good product you have really good customer service when, when shit hits the fan people are there to you know be accountable and make things right the Libertarian Party really doesn't have that infrastructure in place, and they haven't been consistent enough to like have people say like, "Yeah, we're going to stick around 96% of the time." And a lot of it is because when they take that first step into the, the, the movement, and they kind of you know, pull the, the the curtain back and they see what's actually behind the scenes, they're horrified and they get called a, a not a real libertarian and they walk out. So I, I hate seeing people pushed away, and I just want us to get better at bringing people in and keeping them there. Uh, so here's my thing on that. I think we have the same problems that the other movements have like mm -hmm. there's you know there there isn't anything special like people because it's smaller people go i can never be a libertarian because it's too wacky or james weeks dance naked on stage which if you bring up james weeks this many years later you're clearly a moron and not to be taken seriously so but but Chris, you know, I'll, I'll tell you this that's still though even though if you're a libertarian you do that i agree but there are people like outside of our libertarian movement then like people that i know who are politically apathetic and when i mention libertarian stuff to them the first things they think of gary johnson aleppo naked guy on stage and no, like i know that's what i'm saying that, like local yeah. conservative talk host said it yesterday to me on facebook and i said you're just not an intelligent person if you're bringing that up <laughs> like you're yeah. just a dumb person but, but i think the thing with libertarians is because it's such a small movement and until recently there has not been a very um cohesive ecosystem of media podcasting has really given libertarianism its first 
foothold in terms of media. And so if you look at the growth of the conservative movement, it, it sort of starts with National Review. And that's what we are mm-hmm. libertarians, what when I set out to, when I kind of, really when Greg Lenz came on and he and I really started talking about what do we want we are libertarians to be and, and talking that through, we wanted it to be the libertarian version of National Review. And that means that it is a place for the various streams of libertarian thought to come and have a voice through the platform. And so you've got Trisha Stewart, who is a Mises caucus libertarian. You've got Brian Nichols, who leans more constitutional conservative. You've got Ryan Lindsay, who is, I don't know if he would call himself a lib sock. He's, he's doing the path next week. I'll ask him. He's, but he's, he's pretty left. You know, mm-hmm. you've got Reinhold, who is, an old school David Nolan libertarian. You've got me who someday I, I go back and forth. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a curious person. And so I'm not the person who's telling you what to think. I'm more like, what do you all think? Um, yeah. Just because I came up in journalism, but uh, you know, and so what, what we are libertarians has always strived to be was to give voice to the movement, to make it a cohesive place, not, not, listen, we're the Mises Caucus. This is the outlet for the Mises Caucus. This is what you need to believe. Join our cult. Um, But come in, listen to these shows, listen to the network, and wrestle with the various concepts that you hear. Read the Libertarian, read the Wall Reader, be challenged by these articles, and uh, grow yourself intellectually. Yeah. And what you saw in the conservative movement was that it, you had to have a starting point like that in the National Review. Buckley brought in people like Frank Myers and, and Russell Kirk, and the two of them, Meyer was a huge libertarian, Kirk was a huge conservative, and he quit the National Review because Meyer was involved. You know, Rothbard wrote in the early days of National Review mm-hmm. um, until he was politely asked to not come back because of his <laughs> unpleasant personality, um, which... Uh, love Rothbard's intellectual work, but that seems to be a pattern. Um, and so the National Review, because it gave voice, a cohesive voice to the various strains, it it then helped lay the path for other avenues like talk radio, the Reagan Revolution, the various PACs. And, and you end with sort of the Grover Norquist meeting every, I forget what it was, but it was like every Sunday, I think Grover Norquist rented out a ballroom and invited all these various people to come and, 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 you know, if you were in a think tank or a magazine or a talk radio show host and you were around DC, then you'd show up and you'd, you'd, they'd have like a powwow of the next week's talking points. Um, there, there have been a lot of various lunch meetings between people like um, uh, Tony Perkins and, and, he had a lunch meeting. And so what you see is the conservative movement made an effort to kind of lay aside their varying various, uh, they, they, pers- they pursued political power. I mean, that's, that's really what it came down to. And that's why they became a force. And once they actually had political power, then people started to go, all right, we need to take this ideology seriously. They still don't like, look at the reaction to Limbaugh getting the, the medal of freedom. Right. You know, Limbaugh is beloved by half this country and believes half this country believes what he believes but if you listen to the media or the other half of the country this is the most shameful act that trump has done in the history of the world yeah you know because how could you give somebody like that the medal of freedom and those people never really get that like the other half of the country loves that guy yes he speaks for them and they're allowed to have a voice in america too and so what the libertarian movement needs to do in my opinion is calm the fuck down <laughs> like what what i found is that a lot of people in the movement their idea their their identity is wrapped up in being an anarchist their identity yes. is wrapped up in being a libertarian party person their identity is wrapped up in being a voluntarist and so or a ron paul supporter or whatever it may be yes. and so when yep. somebody criticizes any aspect of that they don't see it just as an intellectual criticism they see it as a personal attack that must be avenged immediately with force and aggression, which is hilarious. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm having lunch the other day with the former Marion County chair, and I joked with him like, hey, you're buying lunch because I took this, this former city councilor. He switched parties. He was a grotesque person. And Walker whips out this mailer that was – 
devastating to our campaign and completely untrue. And when I saw it, I was pissed at the time. I was just like, how could they lie like this? And I laughed when he, he goes, yeah, I designed that. And this guy paid for it because he hated that guy so much. And I just laughed. I like, I, because that's just politics. If you're going to be in yes. politics, you have to learn how politics works. And so I think a big part of what the libertarian movement needs to do is if you're, if you're a pragmatic LP person, respect Michael Heiss and the Mises caucus and like get along, like just grow up because you can have disagreements about how certain strategy or tactics may be done or philosophical points, but just respect the fact that the two exist. You know, I mean, there are certain people that I don't want involved in the party like Joshua Smith. I've said that time and time again, because I think he is a dangerous person for the movement because he introduces a demagogic demagogic strain of thought that once that's introduced, it's hard to scrub out just like you see in Trump and the, and the conservative and Republican movements. I mean, it's, you know, it, it allows the norms to change to where disrespecting people becomes the way that you build a movement. And that is not healthy. That's not healthy. That's not helpful. Um, and so that to me, you know, that's why I find certain people intolerable because they just don't have respect for other people. Well, and that's why it's tough. Like you, you should, you know, I think this is one thing as a party we, we have to get better at is not getting attached to particular people, right? It's, it's really easy though. Like when you have one person who's the loudest or who has, you know, whatever past successes behind them that they're carrying forward to get attention. Like when we get so invested in one person, we put all of our eggs in that, in that basket, it's a lot easier for that, you know, to, to go wrong. And right. I think what we've, we've seen happen as we've, we've, we've <laughs> I say as we've grown as a party, but as we've you know, basically existed is that we put our eggs in all these baskets and say, you know, this is the person who's going to make libertarianism, you know, get onto the national stage. This is the person now. And like really the one time it was the person was Ron Paul. And what happened was he inspired a lot of people and he brought people to the movement. And then people didn't stick around for a long time because they didn't necessarily identify with the big L libertarian movement, or they were just, you know, non-establishment folks who, candidly a lot of them went to trump back in 2016 um but ron paul was really that last figure and honestly i i, I can't think of any real libertarian figurehead in the past 50 years who has had as much impact as ron paul did no um, but he's really the only person i mean think if you think from a, a truly national perspective of who brought the most people maybe not into the movement but at least made them more curious about the movement i mean ron paul was making waves in 2012 i mean he was truly a thorn in the side of the establishment um for the gop just much like what bernie was doing in 2016 with hillary i mean yes hillary won just like romney won but they did enough damage to that that candidate that it at least made them have to be acknowledged and that the, they they couldn't pretend that we were not there anymore and yeah. that's something I think we also have to do is, is say, listen, political parties are nothing more than, more than vessels to get our ideas onto a national platform, right? But we can't invest all the time and energy into those candidates. I mean, I'm a much firm believer in the idea that if we can get people into local office, I mean, that's, that's going to be our, it should be honestly, our primary focus. The problem is that people don't vote for libertarians in a local office because when they hear the word libertarian, their first thought is to go towards maybe that one person that we put as like the leader. And they remember that that person was, you know, a complete flop, let's just say, right. And, and, I, and I'm not picking on Gary because Gary did, I listened to your last episode you had with Reinhold and you, you were right. You know, Gary brought in, you know, millions of votes that opened up the doors for the, the folks to have, you know, the, the chance to run on their local uh, ballots because otherwise they didn't have ballot access. But I think that's only part one. Part two, I think is we have to create and establish some credibility on the, the, the lower level. So that means having libertarians like Tom Hugopi, who's gonna be running for like school board, right? right? To show when you're a libertarian in a position of, of a, a power, which, I mean, I'm not gonna get into the dichotomy or the, not the dichotomy, the, um, the, the difference there between power structures and such and libertarians. If you're in an elected office, you're violating principles. I don't care. Like we're, we're not at that point yet to have that conversation. We're so, you know, we're on, as Jason Stapleton like does use that analogy of like, we're on a bus flying through space and like, we're all going towards liberty land, but like we're so far away that you're, that there's no reason to have this argument of who's more libertarian because we're not even close enough to our destination that like it even matters. Like as we get closer to liberty land, if you're like, okay, this is where I'm going to get off by all means, but we're, we're like hundreds of miles from the destination. Right. Um, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Like read piety and power by Tom Lobianco or listen to our interview with him about Mike Pence. And that is a great, that is a great outline of how somebody gets political power. 
and rises through the ranks and it starts small. Yeah. And so if libertarians can start winning local races and you do a good job in that aspect, then you work your way up to the next to state rep and then you get run for Congress and win and then you become a senator and then you become vice president. You know, like that's how politics works. It, it, and what a lot of libertarians don't understand is, A, they never make the effort to understand how politics actually works. And then mm. B, their ego doesn't allow them to start small and work their way up and, and have a long game. I'm going to run for this office and I'm going to win and I'm going to change it in the next year and a half. Instead of realizing the people that you see in high political office have their, their overnight successes who have worked for 10 years in the clubs, right? Right. Like Van Halen was playing backyard parties for 10, 15 years before they became famous. Yes. And they, they exactly. knew more cover songs than any band in history because they had practiced so many hours. And running small, starting small and working your way up and getting, getting a power base behind you in a township trustee's office and then a county clerk's office and then a state rep's office and building an organization over 10 years, that's how people gain political power in the American system. Mm-hmm. The libertarians that won't, won't let their ego get – it gets – but anyways, let's, let's – uh, you mentioned Ron Paul. And for me, the, the moment when I decided that I was no longer a Republican was 2008. Mm-hmm. and it, I, this woman came up to me crying. I was working in the media then. I was working for a local talk radio sh- station, and she's like, you've got to tell the story. They just, they just kicked all the Ron Paul delegates. They violated their own bylaws and state election law and kicked all the Ron Paul delegates out of the convention, and it was, and it was 300 delegates. And mm-hmm. I, so I had heard 700, but uh, when I talked to one person who was super well-connected, he goes, no, it was at least 300 Ron Paul delegates. It's one of the biggest mistakes we've ever made because that just started the local Tea Party because yep. that's where the seeds began. And that was for me, which I bought this shirt that you can see if you would go to our YouTube channel, uh, at a Tea Party meeting because I was th- that person invited me to that Tea Party meeting. Um, I became friends with that, that person. Uh, so the reality is that kicking the Ron Paul delegates out made people like me go, Oh, you can't change it from the inside. I've got to try something different. I'm going to go check out the libertarian party. Uh, and so what was the catalyst for you? Did you have a moment like that where it was a split moment or was it just more gradual or um, you know, what it, changed it for you? There's a, there's actually a couple of moments that kind of like, I, I'm in like, I've been, this is one of the things I've been really trying to think about in terms of how I've actually gotten to where I am. The first was definitely 2008. Um, I remember I was, you know, watching the the GOP debates, and you know, to hear Ron Paul stand up against Rudy Giuliani, and this is, you know, seven short years after 9/11, and basically say like, you know, the reason 9/11 happened is because of U.S. intervention, and, and that that was a, a very ballsy thing to say, yeah. just less than you know, 10 years after one of the worst attacks in American history has ever happened. So that was number one, and it, like it, that wasn't the time that I was like, yeah, rah rah, let's get away from GOP, go towards libertarianism, but it was the first time I really had heard something not the GOP narrative. Um, so that was step one. Step two was actually within a couple of, actually I think the next year. Um, so my home district up in New York, which was formerly New York 23 congressional district up where Jeremiah is also from. Um, we had a redistricting where John McHugh, who was uh, the U.S. congressman there for, I got 20 years or so, um, he got appointed to be secretary of the army uh, by Obama. So there was a special election and they were looking to fill his seat. and pretty much the person who was going to be the shoe in was Didi Skozafava. Didi was um, the New York assembly minority leader, I believe was her position at the time. Um, and she was pretty much as establishment GOP as you could be. Um, and, you know, I'm never going to talk bad about Didi. She's a family friend. And I personally think she's a great person, but she is very milk toast when it comes to her, her values. And it, I mean, she would be what you can think of as a traditional like New York Republican, like that, definition of like a New York Republican thinking of like a New York City liberal, like a Mike Bloomberg, very much what she would be. Um, and there was the beginning of this belief, like this, this resentment really from the right of saying, why is she the candidate? She like, we don't want an Obama person because she said she was going to vote for Obama. We don't no. want an Obama person to be the new Congress person. Like we want an, uh, in this case, it was a, a true constitutional conservative. So I still being Mr. GOP was, you know, still working for, for Didi's campaign as like a volunteer. I was doing phone banking and such like that. 
And I was getting a lot of people on the phone who were like, I'm going to be voting for Doug Hoffman, who was running third party um, as a Tea Party conservative. And I was like, why are more and more people not wanting Dee Dee? And then I would hear their complaints about, you know, her being an establishment hack and blah, blah, blah. And then this election turned into a complete dumpster fire for the GOP. And it was probably the first time I've ever watched a political party be so resoundingly rejected. Um, mm. You know, this was like the beginning of, of Dana Lau. She, she went up to New York 23. She was campaigning for the conservative of get against the, the Democrat or against the Republican rather. So Ended up, Dee Dee had already uh, achieved the nomination to be the Republican candidate, but Doug Hoffman ended up with, I forget how many thousands of votes, and she ended up like, you know, three or four percent of the vote. Um, so the Democrat ended up winning the, the seat, um, but the, the conservative candidate, the constitutional candidate, and really the Tea Party candidate, was a candidate who what came in second versus the Republican. And that was a big, you know, eye-opening moment. And that really was kind of like the the start to like the, the Tea Party movement nationally, because then it went from the, the that electric or that district, Dana Lau started her whole Tea Party campaign and she was going to different elections instead of you know supporting the traditional Republican candidates, supporting these you know, constitutional candidates. So that kind of started my saying, okay, I am not a traditional Republican. I can see that now principles matter. And that's why I started to look at people like, you know, uh, Rand Paul, Thomas Massey, Justin Amash, Mike Lee, Ted Cruz, um, Mark Meadows. And it was all these Republican stalwarts that were true, you know, like constitutional conservatives. And yes, in, in some of these, you know, candidates, small L libertarians. And I started to hear that word more and more and more. And I really didn't look into it too much until around like 2013 is when it really hit me that like, okay, I am not... A Republican. Like I was still Republican, you know, Republican, uh, CR chair uh, for the, the like two years I was in college there, um, you know, as the CR chair. And I was still feeling Republican, -y, but then after 2012's election, I was like, that was icky. They did the Ron Paul. And also Romney's just very milquetoast. And he's just, again, that wishy washy establishment candidate. And I was like, what this is isn't working. And I was like, I need to find a candidate within the GOP who better reflects my ideas. And then Rand Paul kind of hit. Like I was like, oh, I think this is the guy. And it, it was when he was doing his, um, his filibuster for, I think it was mass surveillance or it was the droning on American citizens. I forget which one it was, but I watched that and I was like, I think this is the guy. Like, I think this is the candidate that I can get behind. And then like, it hit me. I, actually, it's funny. I didn't realize that Rand Paul was Ron Paul's son until huh. like after the fact. And I was like, oh, no kidding. Like, okay, now it all kind of makes sense from the, 2008. The, the anti-charisma didn't spark it. I <laughs> think. <laughs> You know, it was, it was funny. I was listening to, um, I forget, I think it was actually Ben Shapiro's show a couple days ago, and they had Mark Meadows on um, for a clip. And Mark Meadows and Rand Paul sound so similar in their voice. Really? And also, uh, I noticed this, and I love Jacob Hornberger from, you know, when he was on my show, but I was listening to the show, again, just kind of doing the audio editing, and I realized that Jacob Hornberger kind of sounds like if Ted Cruz and Jordan Peterson had a baby. Yes. <laughs> like, it. It's yeah. that the delivery of Ted Cruz, but the 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 higher like Kermit the Frog like voice of right. of uh, Jordan Peterson. But yeah. um, but no, I mean that was kind of the moment though with Rand Paul. I was like, okay, I think, I think I'm starting to step away from this GOP thing, and then I started to support Rand Paul in the primaries. And as soon as he lost the primary um in in 2015, that's when I was like, okay, I, I can't do this anymore. Like, I, you know, I I thought we could give a candidate like Rand, like we did with Ron back in you know 2008 and 2012 that he could actually stand up and have a legitimate fighting chance in the primaries. And to see him get so resoundingly rejected because Trump, instead of running as like a, a principled candidate, Trump just ran as in, you know, a bull in the China shop, go in and destroy everything and knock it down. And that, that sentiment resonated with a lot of people. And I don't think a lot of libertarians, you know, understood why Trump was getting so much attention and so much love and I, I will fully admit, Chris, I was one of them. I was, you know, full anti-Trump during the, the 2015, 2016 campaigns. But I'm seeing now much more clearly why people hated Hillary and why people, even if they didn't like Trump personally, and they, they don't maybe like a lot of Trump's politics, he look, they look at Trump as the anti-establishment and the anti-CNN, the anti-Hillary Clintons. And they look at him as like someone who's going to just at least be a mouthpiece for him. And we really, we haven't as libertarians tapped into kind of like that, that sentiment, I think, like Trump was able to, because yes, we, we talk about our principles, but again, we get stuck in the principles. We get too stuck in doing the messaging, doing the, or, I'm sorry, doing the, like the, the principled arguments for things instead of trying to relate to people to make them feel like, okay, there's value in what they're promoting for me. And I maybe should consider this as an alternative. So 
Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that was kind of in a long, a long roundabout answer. Like it was, it was definitely over a time, like a, a long time frame. but there are like very key moments I remember back to, to thinking of like, okay, this, this is starting to change my, my view. This is starting to change my mindset. Um, to then all of a sudden I, you know, caught the libertarianism and I have full, full blown libertarianism now, Chris. So what were some of your first influences? Like when you, you go, okay, I'm going to check this out. I'm going to dip my toe in the water. What, what were some of the first things that you were like, yeah, this is okay. This is speaking to me. Um, man. So I <laughs> definitely started out. I, I listened to a lot of Rand Paul. I mean, like Rand Paul, Ron Paul. And then I started to, to watch a lot more YouTube videos, which seems to be, um, you know, a lot of people's, you know, they're, they're kind of starting off point is like they get down this, this rabbit hole of YouTube videos until like three in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I started to, to watch, you know, like the Steven Crowders of the world and the, the Ben Shapiro's and actually Glenn Beck too. I listened to a lot of Glenn Beck during 2015, 2016. Um, and I, I, I personally, I think he's a great human. I think his politics are wrong in some areas. Uh, in some areas, but he has, I have been a Glenn Beck fan and a Glenn Beck listener since I ran the board for him back in the mid 2000s at the radio station and have had the chance to meet him a couple times and a super nice person. And I have watched Glenn Beck go from a Rush Limbaugh clone to somebody who will have Matt Kibbe on and flirt yep. with the idea of voting for Gary Johnson talking about bringing the troops home. He's become a little, he's become, he's kind of slipped back more Trumpy lately. Mm -hmm. uh, but Glenn Beck is at least willing to openly discuss libertarian ideas. And one of our biggest episodes in the history of the show was uh, 2013, 2014-ish, where Glenn Beck basically said, you know, I want to be a libertarian, but the libertarians won't let me in and they don't like me. And we did a show on that, which is exactly <laughs> true. And I am an unapologetic Glenn Beck fan because mm -hmm. as a as a broadcaster, as a person who does talk radio, as a person who works in the industry, my paycheck comes from that industry. Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh are two of the most innovative. Ben Shapiro, too. They're innovative people. Their their skill set is unparalleled. Mm -hmm. Even if even if you don't agree with their ideas, you just you go Glenn Beck. What he has built and what he just his prep is insane like he he's somebody that libertarians could listen to and really like get something out of it and think a different way without being you know offended to like when glenn beck or when ben shapiro says you know I'm, I'm sort of a libertarian every single time he says i'm sort of a libertarian he follows it up with bombing brown people or locking people up for heroin like it's it's inevitable like he just he's not a libertarian in any way shape or form he, want, he may lean libertarian but he's not um, but Beck is one of those people that I'm, I'm so with you. Like he, his evolution towards more libertarian ideas has, has paralleled mine. And I've watched him kind of move at the same speed that I have. So I, I'm well, totally and, and with the, you. I was and the part that like really frustrates me, uh, frustrates me a lot of libertarians is that they look at people like Ben Shapiro and, you know, yeah, Glenn Beck, who they're not. Like, and this is the th part two, they're not saying they are full blown libertarians. And a lot of people, like libertarians, when they hear them, like you said, say, you know, I lean libertarian, and then they start talking about non libertarian positions, but they instantly take those non libertarian positions and use them as disqualifiers and say, oh, see, these things you say that you're, you're a libertarian on do not matter because of these core things that I, you know, these are, uh, you know, must haves for me for you to be even close to being an ally. And I think libertarians, we, we have to stop looking at anybody who's not 100% pure libertarian as not being at the very least someone that we can be friendly with and trying to move things forward. I mean, your last episode that I listened to for a uh, past libertarianism, um, uh, uh, Jeff, Jason, Jeff, Jason, Pye. Jason, Jason, thank you. Um, Jason, like talking about how when he's in office, he, he, or when he's helping to promote policy, like he doesn't care if he gets 40 Republicans and 40 Democrats on his side, as long as he's able to get people to, to, you know, help get this one issue that's very important. And yes, is, is, probably libertarian through, he's going to do it. Um, and I think we have to stop trying to make everybody perfect libertarians and try to build coalitions because we're too small to not do that. Like we need yeah. to have people outside of our movement be our allies. I mean, once we're in a position of, you know, respectable, consistent, you know, we have to be taken seriously in America, we, we don't have that luxury. And I think a lot of libertarians forget that, I mean, despite Gary Johnson's success in 2016, we were still only 3% of the, the vote. And like, yeah. that's a big deal. We, we have to reconcile with the fact that 
a lot of Americans, sure, they might be libertarians at like their, their you know, core because they live libertarian principles in their day to day life. But they probably don't identify with libertarians on a political level because we haven't shown them the value from a political standpoint of our ideas. They see it in their personal lives, but they're not able to make that, that bridge between their personal lives and politics. And that's a lot on us. That's, that's our fault because we haven't done a good enough job selling them that bridge and showing them the value to, to join us politically. Um, and that's honestly why the GOP and the Democratic Party have been so consistent in maintaining their, their power over the past 200 years is because they've shown value to their constituency. And unfortunately, that value has been shown through what can I get you in political favors if you vote for me. Republicans, it tends to be you know, military bases um, and, and massive spending in, you know, whether it's infrastructure or what have you. And Democrats, it's usually massive spending in, in welfare programs and, and like, you know, like the, the rights, if you will, that they say, you know, healthcare or education, what have you, getting rid of debt. So people are voting on their self-interest instead of what's right. But it's because back when these two parties really got their, their, you know, their foot through the door and they established themselves as these foundational parties in American politics, now all of a sudden they have that foothold and they're not letting go because they're going to keep on giving their voter base what they want. We had to at least give the voter base something different, but also still give them that value. And I think what they're going to find is the things that we can give them are, listen, instead of like Andrew Yang saying we're going to give you $1,000 in UBI every single month, how about this? We're going to stop taking out $1,000 every single month of your paycheck. That sound okay? Like, is that, is that at least a little bit better? Can we say it's a, a step forward? And I think people would resonate with that. Like, yeah, you know, stop taking $1,000 of my paycheck every single week. Yeah, I, I could get on board with that. But we have to talk about it that way instead of saying we're going to give tax cuts because as soon as they see her tax cuts, they're like, oh, yeah, tax cuts for the rich. Yeah, because you're, you know, a corporatist libertarian shill, which is always funny because, like, if, if libertarians were the corporatist libertarian shill party, like, wouldn't there be more corporations supporting the libertarian party instead of the Democrats Well, well Tom, Wood, Tom Woods recently on Twitter made this point brilliantly, as he usually does. Uh, every rich person I know votes Democrat because they can use the state to force other people to do what they want. Every libertarian I know is poor. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. And, and here's the thing too. And it's, you, I was thinking about this when you were talking about, um, you know, people running for office. I think one of the things with libertarians is that libertarians tend to not like <laughs> successful libertarians. And I say that not trying to be you know, rude to, to a lot of libertarians, but when you think of like successful libertarians who are making a decent money or they're, they're, they're doing financially well, they have nice homes, they, whatever it may be, nice jobs, a lot of them tend to not be involved in the political process. And, and Chris, here's where I think maybe there's the biggest, um, you know, the biggest identifier we can, we can find in terms of the, the political libertarians versus the non-political libertarians is that the political libertarians tend to be those who have not had as much success in their personal lives whether it's financial, relationship-wise, you know, building families, and they want to have some control, like some ability right. to say, like, I'm making a difference, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make, like you said earlier, I'm going to make my libertarianism my, my identity. Right. And instead of saying, like, I'm a successful you know, person in my line of work, I'm a successful person in the gym, I'm a successful person in my relationships, they, their, their metric is I'm a successful person in being the best libertarian. And the problem with that mindset is that you're going to have people who are, you know, the, the successful people in their real lives who maybe are interested in getting involved in the political process. And then they, they just walk into the, it's like that, uh, that uh, is a community that scene where Donald Glover opens the door, the pizzas and like the rooms on fire. That's what the libertarian movement is for a lot of people when they, they, put you know dip, dip their toe in the water to see like is this something for me and then, then they're like no I'm, I'm good and they they look and see like okay who's gonna be uh, the next alternative and they look at the to them the more sane alternative and that's the establishment parties the GOP or the Democrats so um, I, I just think we need to remember that we're not in a position to be rejecting people so so easily and I think we we kind of need to tone down the rhetoric and actually let people who are successful in their, their line of work you know like Larry Sharp he left the private sector doing sales consulting to, to run for, for office as a libertarian. Like that's a self-sacrifice that Larry had to take. And, and, you know, he did, he, he does a lot of great work. Jason Stapleton, he's kind of changed the entire tune of his show to be more focused on bettering yourself as an individual. And, you know, he rebranded everything to wealth, power, and influence, but not so much focusing on the day-to-day -day libertarian politics, but what can you do 
personally to make yourself the best version of yourself, to make you successful, not only, you know, in being the best version of a libertarian, but also financially successful, building, you know, building your, your ability to influence others, which isn't a bad thing to actually, you know, promote our ideas and get people to like say, huh, that was an interesting idea. It's something we have to get better at. I think the way to do it is to stop focusing so much on politics and instead just kind of live your life and show other people like, hey, this is me living my values and this is what's done for me. And here's what we can do for you. Right. So last question, when did you decide to start a podcast? Why and what is it about? Uh, so <laughs> I started my podcast originally when I was working for uh, Austin Peterson's Libertarian Republic back in 2016, 2016, 2016. Yeah. 2017, 2017. It's been a long time. It's, it's kind of funny. That's been already five years. I've been involved in this, this wild and crazy movement, but um, I was the associate editor. I still actually am the associate editor over at a Libertarian Republic and Austin gave me the chance to do a show and it was called the Around the Republic podcast. So um, I did that show for about three, four months or so. And it was really just focused on getting uh, editors from the, the Libertarian Republic come on the show and talk about what the news stories were of the week. Um, and that kind of transitioned as the, the summer went on to having a few guests in the show. So I had John Ziegler from Media, uh, Super Mexican, I think from Town Hall, uh, Cliff Maloney, Young Americans for Liberty. And I was able to ask them a lot of interesting questions. And I, it kind of, I thought, I was like, this is something that I enjoy doing. Like I enjoy having guests on. And when you and I started talking, I mean, you let me, uh, you know, appear in the, the show a couple of times in the big channel, We Are Libertarians. Um, and that was a, a blast like, I, to talk to you guys. I was like, you know, this, this is my medium. I love the podcasting environment. So at end of 2017, going to 2018, you and I were talking and you, you, you'd mentioned that the show uh, was going to be kind of changing and the network overall was going to be changing and you were trying to have more voices come out of the show. So I, you know, with our, our talking and stuff, you, you gave me the green light to, uh, to start my show, um, which started back in 2018, January, 2018. And uh, you know, really the show started out with me, just wanting to, to kind of voice my thoughts and, and try to articulate things in a way that I think you can do a better job with a podcast and you can be beyond the confines of like a Twitter or a Facebook. Like there's, there's no nuance in, in just the, the written word. You know? I'm known for my expansiveness. And uh, <laughs> if, you follow, if you follow me on Twitter or Facebook or social media in general, you just think I'm a shit posting troll who doesn't really know what he believes because he's uh, pro Trump sometimes and anti Trump other time. Like, if you listen to the podcast, you know where I stand. You know what we talk about. Yeah. You know that there's depth there. Like it, it, social media allows for flat interpretations of a person's <laughs> opinions, whereas yes. a podcast gives you depth. It l allows you to have a conversation and go, okay, I, I didn't. I guess I didn't see at that point because Reinhold mm -hmm. will say something a certain way, and I'll go, oh yeah, okay, I get it. You know, yeah. so podcasts are great. Unfortunately, I have to take this time to tell you that I'm canceling your show. It's been fun. Thank you so much for being a part of it. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, so, yeah, how can people find the podcast? Yeah, so um, there's a couple different ways. Number one, uh, they can head over to, uh, to briannicholsshow.com. Um, you can find all, the, pod or all the, the podcasts from, you know, all 100 episodes, including a lot of bonus episodes, uh, my appearing on other shows. Um, and, you know, one of the things I think I found the most fun about this this entire opportunity that you you give me, Chris, is that I've been able to have people on my show um, who are a lot smarter than me. And if I can leave the audience with this, it's that I think we need to start learning to humble ourselves more and acknowledge that there are things that we don't know. And, and that's part of the thing with my show is I want to have people on my show who are smarter than me to talk about things that I know my audience are curious about. And instead of just trying to get people who are going to regurgitate the, the same you know, narrative that we hear every single day in our, you know, our Facebook groups and the podcasts that we listen to, I want to have people on the show who are, who are different and who have different perspectives. I mean, I've had, uh, I had Keith Rubino on my show uh, who did an episode on Ask a Democratic Socialist. I had Michael Johns, one of the original Tea Party founders um, at, like from Tea Party National, and he's all rah, rah Trump. I had him on my show. I had Steve Malloy, who was a, you know, tr one of Trump's EPA uh, transition chairs to discuss climate change. I've had anarchists like Adam Kokesh on my show. I've had Jeffrey Tucker, you know, economist Matt Kibbe, elected officials like Justin Amash and Thomas Massey. So to, to have people on my show and then take the questions I get from my audience and, and just kind of like, I, I like to engage a lot with the audience to hear the things that they're saying and then ask those like genuine questions because just in my experience, when I listen to podcasts, if I hear somebody give a, a, a guest a softball question to give them a softball answer, it makes me kind of feel like, you know, violated. It's like, come on, man. Like I'm on, I'm listening to your show to hear like 
really interesting things, different perspectives, and maybe challenging my, my own personal views. And that's why I want to have people on my show who are all different. So um, if you, people want to go ahead, Um, you can find me on, on social media, all uh, on Twitter and on Facebook at Liberty. Um, But yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a blast, Chris. And I, I really, I mean, personally, thank you for giving me the opportunity. And, you know, it's been, I think the past three years, especially I've gotten to know you personally more and, and gotten more involved in the network and, and got to know a really, a great group of people that I now consider to be really good friends and lifetime, uh, you know, long friends. It's it's fun to find almost like a unique sense of purpose in a different world. Um, mm. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this. Gary Collins has been on my show. Um, he wrote the, uh, the book, uh, Your Better Life. And he has a podcast, Your Better Life. And he focused on what's called the simple life. And one of the, the main, like it's one of the main things of his, his uh, program is the, the three pillar uh, stool. And it's number one, your financial health. Uh, number two, your personal health. And number three, your sense of purpose. Right. And, you know, being on the We're Libertarians network and being able to have a voice and to meet a lot of really cool people, to talk to a lot of really cool people. And for me, see that I'm actually reaching people, helping change hearts and minds, and knowing that this wouldn't have been possible without the opportunity you gave me um, and, you know, the, the, the platform you give me. And that's really helped me give me that, that you know, sense of purpose. And I wanted to say, you know, thank you to you. Uh, personally for that opportunity, but also, you know, thanks to all the We Are Libertarians family who's, you know, been very supportive in, you know, not only like listening to the show and being members of the audience, but, you know, people like Craig DaCosta, you know, going out of their way to, to you know, contribute not only to my show, but also to the greater We Are Libertarian show, you know, Christy Avery and all the, the great people, Jason Doolittle, you know, it, it means a lot to know that there are people out there who they appreciate what we do, you know, both by downloading the shows, but also financially supporting us. And that's how we really keep the lights on. We're able to do what we do. So, you know, to you, Chris, thank you. And to all the people who support us financially and, and, and otherwise, you know, that means a lot. All right, great. Well, I couldn't have said it better myself. Brian Nichols, <laughs> N-I-C-H-O-L-S. You can also find links at wearelibertarians.com if you forget how to spell his name. Uh, thank you so much for joining me, Brian. Yeah, no, Curse is a blast, and uh, thank you again for doing this this series. It's a lot of fun. Absolutely. We'll talk to you next week. Rock and roll. I like it.